Welcome to Tooling Up, a series by MSC Industrial Supply Company that provides real-world insights brought to you by leading industry experts and aimed at improving the efficiency and productivity of your operations. Welcome to MSC's second episode of Tooling Up. My name is Jamie Gettler. Once again, I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Scott Smith and Dr. Tom Kerfus. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us again. During the first episode, you'll recall that we spoke about Executive Order 13806 and the assessment which found that the American manufacturing base had some areas for improvement and it was really based around the, the needs potentially if there was a homeland security threat. Now, a year ago, though we didn't have a homeland security threat, we had the pandemic that happened with COVID-19. And Dr. Smith, I'd love to start with you. You know, what did that pandemic prove to us as it relates to Executive Order 13806? Well, thanks, Jamie. I, I think what we saw is that the assessment in response to 13806 was accurate. Um, you know, what was true for national security issues is true for the economy generally. And so, for example, one of the things that was called out in the report was our overdependence on offshore resources and entities. We saw that in response to the pandemic when suddenly we had a surge in demand for personal protective equipment. We needed face masks. We needed test tubes for nasal swab samples and so on. The lead time on the tooling to increase our production of those items is on the order of six months to a year. And that's without other people in the world competing for those resources. So all of a sudden there's a problem. And, um, you know, I, a, a lot of rally to, to address the issue. A lot of uh, makers around the country uh, use their capabilities to print, you know, halos for face shields and so on. And God love them. I, you know, they, they jumped into the, into the fight and did their best. And, you know, over a few weekends produced thousands of, uh, of such devices. But of course, if we could produce the tooling, you know, thousands of devices is kind of a bad hour in a production run with mass production tooling. And so I think what we saw is that this over-reliance on foreign sources is a problem for the entirety of the economy. You know, it, it was obvious, Scott, and thank you for your response. Tom, you know, I'm curious as somewhat of a follow-up, I, I know you, you were right at, at the heart of, you know, making the adjustments. What can the U.S. do to respond to this? How, who can help? How can we help? And how did we respond? So, Tom, tell me a little bit about, you know, your experiences, you know, on behalf of the United States a year ago, you know, based on this need for face masks and face shields and ventilator parts and test tubes. Tell me what you experienced there, too. Sure. Well, Jamie, I, I think that it, it, it was it was a scary time. But it was also a very exciting time because you looked at it and it's exactly what Scott said is, huh, we've got some of the solutions to these things. So, for example, and, and again, as Scott said, people were, were printing with their, with their uh, uh, small 3D printers, uh, personal protective equipment, face, face shield holders, and so forth. Uh, but what we were looking at is we were using our hybrid system. So we were putting metal down, uh, and then we were machining uh, that metal so that we could, we could turn that into molds. And so for, for injection molding, so we could start to make these types of, of, uh, of components. And even on the materials. Um, we, we turned our carbon fiber technology facility, which produces about 25 tons of, of, of carbon fiber material a year, uh, into an N95 uh, a production facility. And really, we weren't super interested, and this is what I, I mentioned last time, we weren't super interested in, in producing it ourselves. I, I mean, 25 tons sounds a lot, you know, it sounds like a, a big number, but the reality is it's not very big when you compare it to, to some of our partners and what they make. So we work closely with, with Cummins, for example, and, you know, they're, they're, they're doing engines. Right, but it, all engines have filters on them. 
right. So then they they connected us with their their filter producer, and we said, okay, here's how you can convert your line into using N95 and produce those N95 that material, and then get it down to a company. I believe it's down in Florida that's actually making the mass. And, that, and by the way, that also created jobs as well. So I mean, it worked all the way around. The other thing that was really interesting is, and you know this because you and I were on the phone all the time and texting and sending email back and forth, and hey, can you get this design? And it, you know, part of it's not good enough just to make the mold, but you got to drop it in the machine. How does it fit in the machine? And you have different machines to fit it in there and so forth. So this whole digital connection where we could basically say, hey, as opposed to me calling Jamie and then you know, saying, hey, Scott, this is what we need to hook into our, our injection molder and so forth, if all of that could happen digitally and electronically and securely all of a sudden, you have a super high-speed capability. So, yes, we were successful, but we also uncovered, I think, a lot of weaknesses that we're working to address, which is a very exciting thing. And a lot of those things that we could just – we're going to nail them to the wall uh, in, in the next few years. I'll tell you that. It's exciting. I, you know, I think – It is exciting. Scott, really yeah, exciting add, please add. It was a really exciting time to be at Oak Ridge uh, and we, Oak Ridge National Lab. We certainly made a difference. We, we had the people and the tools to really help in this regard. Um, those techniques, those things that Tom discussed, need a much wider deployment. Well, let me just add one more yeah, thing. Please. Yeah, please. So, so Scott said it was an exciting time to be at Oak Ridge. No doubt. I mean, man, oh, man, we were running flat out. But I got to say, it was an exciting time to be a manufacturer. I, I just watched some of our partners, and they were into it. They're like, we are saving people. They interacted with hospitals and, and, and with, uh, you know, uh, uh, with, with the Tennessee you know, uh, version of FEMA or the Georgia version of FEMA, where, where these doctors are just saying, thank you so much for, for getting us this equipment and this material and so forth. I mean, it was, it was uh, you know, you just can't beat the excitement and, and the feeling of accomplishment. I know it was a tough time, and those are dark times. But the accomplishments and, and, and the way that the community came together and just delivered was outstanding. Yeah, you know, gentlemen, you know, we, we had somewhat of a front row seat, as you mentioned, Tom, uh, to, to work alongside you and witness you know, the power of technology in the minds and, and the human you know, strive to, to meet this demand. Uh, as concerning as it was, and, and, and certainly we, we were proud to be part of it, but it was, it was more uh, the, the outcomes. And, and you said it yourself, not only the associates at Oak Ridge, but, but your, your partners that you all work with there, they, they all chipped in from all different types of market segments to help support what was necessary. And it, and it was a beautiful thing. To, to have seen, and, and you guys should be proud, and, and, and we're certainly proud for a very small part that, that MSE played in it. You know, Scott, I'll come back to you on, on this one, and, and that's to say, you know, what can we use from the pandemic, you know, that we learned? We, we, we learned that we were over-dependent, but, but now there's this notion and this want nationwide to domesticate the supply chain, to become more independent. And in order to do that, we got to become more competitive. What are some of the things that either additionally that we learned or that we're, you're starting to see happen across the United States that puts us in a position where, where that feeling never happens again? Well, I think certainly Tom pointed out one of the things that's really right. Um, you know, the, the, the report to uh, 13806 uh, called out the skills gap as well. And, you know, we spent a generation telling people that manufacturing was not a good career choice. And then we're surprised when we need it and there's not a pipeline of people ready to fill all of those manufacturing jobs. And there are lots of manufacturing jobs going unfilled. However, I'm really hopeful about it because I think there's a new generation of workforce that's, that's coming up who are very technically savvy um, they use the data to make better decisions. It's not the kind of manual labor that it used to be at one time. It's a knowledge business. And uh, so I, I think uh, spending a lot of effort in that, you know, I, I want to be careful when I say workforce development, because a lot of people, when they hear workforce development, they, they see that as machine operators. Now, that's really important, and those are good jobs. And... I mean more than that. I mean the whole ecosystem, all the way from people who don't have high school diplomas uh, to the designers of new equipment and the writers of new software and the entrepreneurs who are going to start the new companies. 
And we need to support all of that. And I think that became clear during the pandemic. I mean, we, we knew it before. It was certainly called out in the report. And I think it was pointed out to us quite clearly during the pandemic. Yeah, by all means, Dr. Kerfus, anything you would add to what Scott shared there? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I think that the good Dr. Smith is is right on the money, and and I'll I'll take it a, a little bit of a step further because it is true that yeah, we, we need to really leverage the technology that's out there and move things forward, um, and and so that doesn't mean oh, a machine operator or or you know hey this is your father's or grandfather's machine tool or CNC and so forth. It, it's a it's a whole different era. And I mean, just as an example, my, uh, you know, my mother, she's 82 years old. Well, maybe I shouldn't have given her age away on, on the podcast. Hopefully she's not listening, right? Uh, she tends to listen to a lot of these things. She, you know, we, we, we I, I have a up. feeling she will listen, but go ahead. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be in trouble. That's okay. Yeah. But, but the reality, so look, she's 82 years old. Um, if she's going to go out to lunch, right, what does she do? She, she, she picks up her smartphone, brings up the weather map, and, and, and that'll tell her whether she needs to, to, to bring an umbrella or not. It'll even project out, hey, here's what it's going to be like for the next few hours. She is accessing a constellation of NOAA satellites that are transmitting down terabytes of data that are being integrated with ground Doppler radar terabytes of data running the latest generation of weather models on supercomputers. My 82-year-old mother is doing this, right? And, and so this is exactly where manufacturing is going. We're going to put that type of capability at the fingertips of, uh, you know, the operator. I mean, almost we need a new word. It's not going to be operating anymore. It's, it's, I, I don't know what the right terminology is, but, but they're going to be doing amazing things with the technology and they're going to be comfortable with it, which is very exciting. And that's where we're going. Yeah, I, I can see it potentially becoming productivity consultants more than operators. There's so many opportunities yeah. using Industry 4.0 endeavors or otherwise to, to improve businesses and, and everybody take their part. So you know, once again, gentlemen, I can't, I can't thank you enough. This was a really, you know, I expect every one of our episodes, especially the ones that you guys participate in, to be you know, so helpful and so enlightening you know, for, for the viewers. But you know, where, where Scott you know, started to, to talk about, and Tom, you took off on it a little bit, is the manufacturing skills gap. And, and as we move to uh, our follow-up episode in, in the last of our first three uh, with, with you guys, looking forward to talking about the skills gap. You know, how do you feel where we are today? Are, are we making improvements? Are we upskilling existing workers? Are we introducing manufacturing and what the reality is of manufacturing today to a new generation? And uh, what about productivity improvements in areas where maybe there aren't enough skilled workers or productivity improvements thriving out there? So as we move away from this particular segment, gentlemen, once again, I wanna thank you and I wanna thank the viewers for uh, watching MSC's Tooling Up and we'll see you on our next episode. Want more insights and ideas to improve the efficiency and productivity of your operations? Watch more Tooling Up videos now or subscribe to our channel so you never miss out.